Hello and welcome to the new season and to this evening's webinar on the theme of being the best coach you can be. Thank you so much for, for joining us and giving your time tonight. Uh, we are really looking forward to spending the next hour or so doing one of our favourite things, which is discussing football and coaching. Um, you know, think back to your childhood. What are the characteristics that kind of you associate with some of the, the coaches that you had that, you know, really favourable when, when you think back? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to have a very lo uh, long look back at this one, Ryan. I think I'm going back into the, into the, sto <laughs> into the Stone one. Ages. The, the, the thing about um, any coach, I think, and the coaches that, that I were my favourite were the ones who um, who always taught you something, who always who engaged with you. Um, I, I, I can remember my earliest uh, um, uh, coach when I was, must have been about must have been about ten, and he just made it fun. That's all he did. He just made it fun all the time. You know, he, he would make games up. I, he was, I don't even think he was a, I don't even think he was a qualified coach. He was a teacher. And he made, he made everything fun, you know, and he engaged us in not just football, but lots of other activities. You know, I think about some of the other characteristics and, you know, th this particular coach um, and teacher was, you know, very approachable as well. Mm. You know, felt, you know, I felt like, you know, if I had a problem, they'd, they'd be the person I could go to and, and speak to and they were really, really approachable. Um, you know, kind, considerate, made me feel valued and, mm. and important, if that makes sense as well. And mm. I think something else, and, you know, one of, one of my grassroots coaches as well, um, something that they did and is is give me opportunities to have, like, leadership roles. Mm. Yeah. The team, but all of us to, to have these leadership roles. Mm. And, you know, I think we don't necessarily always associate you know the, the the coaches who can give us the best technical and tactical knowledge but the ones who give us opportunities to develop as a person as well doesn't it all those things you know that you've talked about Pete, all those things that have come in from the chat box ultimately lead to this don't they which is that everything we do as a coach is is to help the players that we work with get better mm. at, at football yes absolutely but also as a person and how can we help out the players that we're working with whatever age it might be um, whatever environment it might be, how can we help them improve them technically on the pitch? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a phrase that we often talk about, don't we, day to day, Pete, is around developing more skillful players. And yeah. I think, you know, a big question to answer on this subject is what are the skills that, that we do actually want to develop? I think it's, it's, it's the joy that scoring a goal brings in the players. I think that's really, that's the thing that stood out for me. You know, no matter who who we are, you know, where we play, you know, how old, how young, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is, the game is about scoring goals. Um, and to, to, to see that joy on, on players' faces when they when, when they have those moments, I think it's, it's brilliant. Do our practices and sessions allow the players plenty of opportunities to, to score and stop goals? Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, if, if what we're saying is that, you know, you know, Matthew's talked about there in the chat box, that passion of stopping scoring goals. Mm. You know, we need some goals in, in our practices to, to, for, for that to happen. And, you know, thinking out from a technical point of view as well, that, you know, the next video that we're going to come on to, uh, looking at, um, you know, some highlights of a, of a session um, from Pete Sturgis, and it's got goals in, which, you know, automatically makes it directional. And, you know, some of the things that we always talk about, Pete, isn't it, uh, that, you know, highlighting the importance of penetration, going forward, getting through the defence to give you the opportunity to score goals. And, you know, thinking forward, looking forward, playing forward. And you'll see in, 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 in Pete Stage's practice in a second that, you know, just by having that goals, it allows, it allows the players to do that and constantly be thinking about that. Have to hold the ball in our hands. When planning your session, look at the game that young players play. It's not the adult version. There will be more mistakes and the ball is likely to go out of play a lot. Rather than seeing this as a bad thing, use it positively to develop other areas. Quick reactions, quick decisions and attacks. Well done. Keep the ball in play, Isabella. Oh, she dribbled it out. She Red, she dribbled it out. Alice! <laughs> That's what we want. You can score in the normal way. But you can also score if you trick your opponent. In order to produce more skillful players, can we introduce the idea of a player changing their mind at the last minute? Oh, what's Olivia got? Oh, yes. 
I think that deserves a goal. That was tricky. Any great turn like that, Olivia? Oh, Megan's doing it. If the ball goes out of play, keep the game going by dropping the next ball in, rather than have players running off the pitch for the ball that's gone out. What you got? Oh, she's trying it. It's come off. Charlotte, two goals for the trickiest player and rest there. Word that keeps coming up from, from, from the coaches in the chat boxes around that environment that you set. Yeah. And that positive environment, isn't it? And, you know, that that's everything from the, the praise, the encouragement, the practice design, which, you know, allows it to be fun. The little things like, you know, that, that, that first game where the players actually had the balls in the hand. Mm. So when it yeah. went out, they could just put the nearest one down and off we it's go. Fun. You know, yeah. just yeah. a little thing like that can have a massive effect on the mm. engagement of the players and you know in the second one Pete, Pete had two balls under his arm so it goes yeah. out right so straight away the players are reacting mm -hmm. and yeah. um, you know all these things you know might just might just be tiny little things but really add up to allowing us to develop those skillful players don't they this step principle mm. Um and it's it's a great tool to consider when we are talking about practice design to really help promote that that skillful play, um, at an appropriate level for the players that you that you're working with, um, either by adapting an activity or introducing a constraint. Um, so, but you know, for those who've you've come across the the step principle before, or a reminder for those um, you know for those who have or, or those who haven't, it I think it's worth briefly looking at what it stands for and. You know how it can really help us to to be the best coach we, we can be one touch or three or more so that the players when they receive the ball and it's such a good way of getting the players to think about how they're going to um, um they're going to receive the ball how they're going to what they're going to do how they have to think so they can't just yeah. so once they've had that first touch if they, if they haven't passed it they now have to stay on the ball yeah and i think that's uh, you know i've used that at, at different ages so i've used it with small uh, young kids i've used it with adults and it's really it's amazing what that does to to the thought processes of players yeah our six capabilities um and this is something which you know we we often refer to we're talking about a lot um, and something which will be familiar to any coaches who have done any recent courses or or cpd sessions with us across the country and you know essentially it's it's actions which form um an observational toolkit, if you like, isn't it, for coaches? You know, mm. we talk about the art of noticing and, you know, if we want to help our players to improve technically, then, you know, can we observe what are some of the things which they might need to do to be able to improve technically? And we understand, right, we can help them in that area. So, mm. you know, for example, it might be around that if we look at those six capabilities, someone might be great at, um, you know, technically receiving the ball, mm. but they might not be aware in terms of where they're scanning, you know, in terms of the scanning, a bit aware of what's going on around them. I think by using these six capabilities, we can, you know, really help our players to develop in that in those skillful environments, can't we? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think one of the things is, you know, when, we, when we're, especially with, with something like this, I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show off a little bit now. I, I mean, I, I've, I've laminated these six capabilities. And the reason why I, I did this, and I used to do this with... Um, um, uh, uh, principles of play. I would have those um, on written on my tactics board, and I would do that because I'd go right. And when I'm watching the game, I'm going, "Are they doing this? We've got the ball now. Are we creating space? Are we doing this? Are we doing?" This? And it's the same thing with it with, with the six capabilities. I'm looking at my players, especially possibly more my midfield players, and I'm going, "But are they actually looking at where the ball's coming from or where they're going to?" Are they are they moving to get into little spaces so that they can receive the ball, or are they just standing still? Um, what is their positioning? How, you know, when did they receive the ball? How you know you, you know you quite often see uh, uh, players uh, drilling balls into each other because they've been taught that that's the way to do it. Sometimes you might invite the player to come onto the ball because you know there's there's a player who's quite tight behind them, but you're looking to get to move that player forward so you can play the next ball in maybe behind the, the, the player you're playing the ball to. So all those sort of things, you know, are, are so important. The, bit, the piece around deception. And now if you look at the game now, you look at the goalkeepers, they're providing deception now, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, you know? so yeah. deception can come in anywhere. So it's not just your centre forward or your yeah. midfield play, it's your goalkeeper as well. Absolutely. So, 
if we just watch it through again, what are some of the things? So straight away, you know, Kira's talk about scanning, deception, movement of time of the past. Brilliant, fantastic. Katie, the space and the movement, the deception. What are you seeing? Which players are you seeing do some of those six capabilities? So part two, which is, is this question here, which is how can we help our players to improve socially and psychologically as well? We can certainly use football as, as that tool to, to help develop the people we work with holistically, whatever age they are, and, you know, help prepare them for life, ultimately, aren't we? You know, in terms of in terms of some of the things that, that, that we can really help them with, you know, and help them to be the best on and off the pitch. From, from your point of view or from, from other age groups that you work with that, you know, might really help in terms of developing them socially, developing them psychologically? Yeah, I think I think the real important thing is, is that football needs to be a safe space for the players. So, um, and some of that is around uh, the environment that you create. And I think creating an environment with the players as opposed to for the players, that makes a massive difference. Yeah. Because quite often, say these are the rules. Well, how do we know that the the, the rules are are, are, are okay f f with the players? They might not like that. They might not. They might think it's unfair. Um, it might be uh, some things around travel, travel distance. You know, how do we how do we make sure that, um, uh, that, that, that a player who's coming from a long way? I mean, I work in the London area, and quite often kids are making quite young kids are making um journeys quite considerable uh, quite considerable journeys on their own so why would we then have a rule that if, if you're late you're going to have to do 50 press-ups when we know that one of our kids is coming from a long way and they and they having to leave school and then get home maybe they might be helping their parents and so on and so forth we have to understand that so understanding our place is really really crucial um even down to you know what time we start training can we have time of training that, that will help all the players to get there on time? Um, having having uh, open conversations with your players, I think that's really important. Then that your your players, if, if they need to come and talk to you, they can come and talk to you. I found really helps in the match day was, you know, linked to the training that we done in the week. The the players came up with objectives for the for the match. Yeah, with an in possession objective and out of possession objective. Yeah, yeah. You know, based on some of the things the themes that we looked at that week. And mm. what I found worked really well was the players, there'd be three each game, would go and share those prior to kickoff with the parents on the sideline. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, we often talk about, you know, um, maybe challenges that, that parents might give because they're, you know, from, from, from a good place in terms of their enthusiasm. But, you know, I think in terms of getting them to buy into what we're doing, I found that, you know, worked. so it gave the, the players those leadership opportunities to, to reflect on the training Mm -hmm. to come up with their own objectives that they were going to focus and mm -hmm. then to go over, put themselves out of the comfort zone a little bit at the start mm -hmm. of the season by going over to a set of parents and saying, right, here's our whiteboard. This is what we're going to be looking at today. Yeah. And I think that, that really helped in terms of framing some of the conversations on the way home as well. We did this, this work here. Yeah. And what we should be asking them, asking the players that start again, what did we work on on Thursday night? And see if they remember. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if, and if they haven't, have we taught it well enough? Mm. That's kind of the things we've got to kind of think about. We, you know, they're there. We've got to think about ourselves. Are we giving the, the, the best advice that we can be and shaping the, the, the learning in the best way for the players? Don't underestimate our players in terms mm. of what they're capable of. Yeah. You know, how many times the coach do we, right, we're doing it this way, this is out of the practice runs, and give them the opportunity to, to court games, you know, Again, just a, just a little story. I, you know, I was doing some stuff. Um, we as a PE team um, were doing some stuff within within a primary school just before the summer holidays, mm. um, and we actually we literally just put loads of equipment on the playground. Mm. We stepped back and just said, "Right, off you go." And these were like reception children, year ones, year mm. twos, you know, five, six, seven years old, and they were coming up with games, and we were pinching them, we were writing them down. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And these are, these are five year olds because. They've got that kid, but they didn't need us there. They, they came up yeah. with their own games. They were playing yeah. all different types of games using different equipment. And, yeah. you know, I think that's probably something really valuable to consider, isn't it? That don't underestimate what, what they're actually capable of. One practice design that um, I, I, I've used, which has been, you know, really useful for me in terms of developing some of those technical skills, but also in terms of allowing the players to make decisions as well and scaffolding it in terms of making it appropriate for whichever group that I might be working with at the moment. So um, 
really simple concept. So we've got two end zones, if you like, that you can see marked out on the pitch, um, shaded in. And we've got uh, four teams. Now, premise of the game, really simply, is so we've got the team who you'll see moving in a second. So I think we call, do we call them Aston Villa, Man City, Plymouth and Wimbledon, I think we called them, Pete, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> uh, we got, we'll start with Man City. So Man City, and all the, the to score a point, some one of their team has got to receive it in an end zone. So we can see here the move in, the pass in, and score a point, receive it in the end zone. I'm going to add that little bit of unopposed interference. So we've got four teams who are all doing the same thing. So they're not concerned about what the other teams are doing. Obviously, the other teams will be getting in the way unintentionally at some times, but you can see it's a little bit more chaotic in terms of them trying to get the ball to the other end. Plymouth, I think we call them, our green Plymouth. team. Yeah. Uh, they, we might take their ball away and they become an actual defending team. Mm. So their job isn't to score by getting the ball from end to end. Their job is to touch one of the footballs to score a goal. So suddenly we've got this overloaded situation where we've got three three teams of three who are trying to get end to end and we've got one team who are, who are trying to win the ball uh, to score a point themselves. Depending on where our team or our group of players are at, that might be the level that works for them. And, you know, hopefully that, that just gives a, a really simple practice idea which kind of consolidates a lot of the things that, we, that we've talked about tonight in terms of, from a psychological point of view, social point of view because they're working in a team, got that communication aspect um, as well as those technical skills those core skills and, and those six capabilities which you can really analyse as the game's going on theme of tonight is becoming the best coach that we can be and we know no matter what our experience no matter what our qualifications no matter how much CPD we've done we can always improve in terms of the coach that, that we are and so we're going to pose a question out with Pete which I think will be you know, it'd be great to see some of the answers that come into the chat box around you know, we started tonight asking what were some of the characteristics of the of the coaches that you had when you were when you were younger, when you were a child. I'll, we're going to flip that over now. So, if you wouldn't mind just adding to the chat, it would be fantastic to get some thoughts. Honestly, as you're reflecting, what would your players that you work with at the moment say about you in twenty years' time? The thing about that's really important is is to share. Is that I think sometimes we think that we've um, we've 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 kind of we've, we've cracked it and we've got all the ideas, but there's so much sharing that's going on in this in in in, in this in this um, uh, in, in the in the chat box. Here. It's brilliant. I mean, even when we talk about when we take a session, so your your session that you you've shown up there, are we going to take that? We're going to pop copy and paste it, or are we going to take it and develop it? Because yeah, that's really important, you know. Because it might not. Uh, uh, you'll teach it one way. I'll teach it another way. Somebody else will teach it another way. But we should be able to take that session and go, I think I'll develop that because this will help my my players or these players in my team to do this. Yeah, with our four corner model. And I think that's that's a that's a good little tool to use to help us to reflect as well. Mm. And you know, you know, putting it up there about, you know, thinking about yourself as a coach on a on a match day or in training. You know, are you aware of what you look like as a coach, how you come across to your players, how you come mm. across to parents, how you come across to other coaches, mm. you know, and I think, you know, using that as a tool is, is really good in terms of reflection and, and I'd encourage coaches to have a look at that as well. Um, and, you know, we just, we've just put some ideas down there, haven't we, Pete, in terms of, you know, some of the things that might fall into those four corners. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 those physical aspects around your touchline behaviour. Yeah. You know, those coaches that I'm sure we, we're all aware, you know, you see them, they, they spend more time on the pitch than some of the players, you yeah. know, the, <laughs> not in that social side of shouting, communication, with referees, yeah. you know, do they listen to players, you know, um, that, th those psychological skills of, of managing emotions as well, isn't it? Which a lot of the time, I mean, every single coach who's with us tonight has had decisions go against us. You yeah. Know? On, on, and as, as we're coaching, it's it's how do we react to that, and how do our players see us reacting that to that as well, isn't it? This is the question that that, that we're going to leave everyone with, which is, you know, as a result of attending this webinar, and you know, we've been absolutely honoured to have well over two hundred people who, who are with us live tonight, which is fantastic. Um, you know, what what are you going to do differently as a as a coach as a result of attending this webinar?